uh, regarding some of the knowledge that he has. That way we can disseminate it to so many veterans that, you know, a lot of these guys, they have no clue. They have no idea of how to even get started with a disability claim. And you know what? They've earned it. They've, they've been to combat. Uh, sometimes they just don't have the information and they're ignorant and we're going to go ahead and try to enlighten them. We're going to go ask you some questions there, Gunnery Sergeant. Is that all right? That's cool. All right. Now, ladies and gentlemen, be advised. This is not legal advice. He's not representing any entity. This is just an individual that has some knowledge uh, that, that could be useful to other veterans you can take it as you will. If, if I'm asking him the questions, it's because uh, I feel he has uh, some sort of experience uh, with the claim process and, and, and the knowledge within the VA. So very briefly, Gunnery Sergeant, can you explain the disability claim process? Yes, the disability claim process is for any individual that is getting ready to get out of the military that are still on active duty orders or whatnot. Um, it may be somebody that's getting ready to get out within the next few months, or it could either be somebody that's already got out of the military already who has been sitting at home for a while. It's a chance for them to be compensated for any kind of disease or injury that was incurred or aggravated during military service. So um, we go into the military with pretty much a, a fresh body. You're going in as a fresh body, no kind of injuries or anything like that. If you do got any injuries, you're going to get waivers for it. But you have what is called an entrance exam when you do it at the MEPS to join the military. That's just documented. So over your time, when you're in the military, either an aggra aggravation can occur of that existing injury, or you may get something that's new that you didn't have before. So it's just an, a chance for you to be able to get compensated for those injuries because the military was what made those injuries occur or aggravate. Okay. All right. So the reason I'm giving this information is because I I have a very keen interest for veterans and making sure they're taken care of because veterans give a lot to this country. And there's a lot of veterans now out here that are not being taken care of and being forgotten about. So I find it in my life to to make sure those individuals are, are taken care of. And I, I use a lot of my time to either volunteer or I spend time working at veteran service organizations to um, that information that I've gathered from those places. I can, I can give it out and feel pretty confident about what it is I'm giving. Hey brother Avery, man, that's beautiful, man. And, and you know, the thing about it is, and, and it sounds cheesy, man, but really guys, information is power especially yep. with dealing with the VA, man. If you go in there clueless uh, like a lamb, you're going to be slaughtered and, and, and your ribs going to be eaten. You hear what I'm saying? You do, and, and that's where it up. You do not want to go and submit paperwork for a disability claim with the VA with, without having uh, some sort of knowledge of the details of what it is that you're submitting for, man. You got to do your homework, guys. Uh, you, you may be lucky w once or twice, depending on who who receives your paperwork. You may be lucky, but I guarantee you, man, that's a slim chance. Uh, now, moving on to the next question, Brother Avery, w what are some common mistakes you see veterans make when filing their VA claims? I got two for you. Um, the first one, I find very important, and a lot of veterans don't take advantage of it. You have veteran service organizations out there that are willing to assist you throughout the whole process and represent you towards the VA when it comes to your claim. You're talking about individuals who may have been veterans themselves or individuals who just love veterans and want to take care of them that are there to help you with your claims. So... There, there's many veterans organizations out there who can help you with your claims that, that are like the, you got the veterans of foreign wars, the VFW, you have the M vets, you have the disabled American veterans, you have Vietnam veterans, you have black American veterans. There's so many veterans organizations out there that you can use that are free, free, F-R-E-E, -E, that will help you with your claim and get you going in the right direction. One of the biggest mistakes I see 
is that veterans, um, they try to do it themselves. They go in there blindly, like you said, not have the knowledge of how to navigate the VA process. And that's how a lot of stuff gets denied. You have to go in there and you got to be represented by somebody who can help you out. And that's what those organizations can do. The second thing is I see so many veterans, they get out the military and they wait for a long period of time before they make a claim. You have a golden period. Like, say, for example, you get out January 15th of 2016. Like, you get out of the military, that's your, that's your last day, that's it. Mm. You have a year from January 15th, 2016 to January 15th of 2017. Anything that occurred within the military, the VA is going to look at it in a favorable way within that year if you come in with a claim. So if you have a veteran who waits five years, a veteran who waits 10 years, a veteran who waits 20 years and says, oh, I had issues because of the military, I'm having problems now, like it's not going to be very favorable unless it was a presumption, something that you want to get rated on because it's something that occurs, something like Agent Orange, like a Vietnam veteran. Agent Orange claim, if you got diagnosis right now or something that occurred then, yes, we want to help you out. but. I just mm. see where veterans wait too long, man, to try to file claims, man. And I think it's because they don't know or they're, just, they're too prideful, mm. too much ego. I don't know what it is, man, but mm. now, there's so many things to be able to help that now, they should take advantage of. Absolutely. Now, uh, real quick, I've got a question. So you utilize the word presumptive. Uh, mm -hmm. can, can you explain that to the listeners, presumptive? A presumptive, right? So... I use the Vietnam War, for example. You have veterans out there right now who have been diagnosed with diabetes, mellitus 2, uh, prostate cancer. That's just to name a few of the, the presumptives that, that are out there. So if a veteran can prove to the VA that they served in Vietnam with a DD-214, or if the DD-214 doesn't give enough information, They'll look at personnel records to see that you were on ground either on ship in brown water or you may have been in country with boots going to go fight. If we can verify that through your personnel records, like it's going to show that you have a presumption, like you were there, mm. you're certain, and you're going to be okay. Because if you're coming to us now, 40 some years later, 50 some years later, saying that you got these issues. We know it's because of Vietnam. Mm, That's now, presumptive. Now, Gordon Reese, Sergeant Avery, wouldn't you also need, I'm assuming, a current diagnosis of that illness? Yes, a current diagnosis is going to be very, very important. Um, you, when it comes to a presumption, right, like you could have a veteran who got out of the service in 1974. You know, Vietnam didn't end until 75, so 74, they may have went to the doctor, got diagnosed with it, and they didn't see any doctors from that point up until now. I mean, they would be perfectly fine because we have proof that they were in Vietnam, mm. and they do have diagnosis from that period. Mm. Now, so they will be okay. Now, through the presumptive process, would they have to have a a nexus or a connection to prove or because of the presumptive process, would that negate that connection of service with the diagnosis? Yeah. A nexus is not needed in this, in this case. If they show that they were in Vietnam and they got proof of it and we see it, they're going to be okay. Now there's this thing that I'm hearing there, Gunnery Sergeant Avery, that it's called the Gulf War Syndrome. Does that fall into the same category as Agent Orange in Vietnam? It's, it falls into the category of presumptives as well. Yes, it does. So all you would have to do is present a DD-214 stating the area of operation or perhaps a letter of decoration or a combat action ribbon stating where that combat action ribbon is, or perhaps medals uh, to state that you were in that location. And then the current diagnosis with the presumption of the current diagnosis was uh, onset in that particular location. Is that correct? 
Correct. It's got to be within Southwest Asia. Southwest Asia could be Kuwait. It could be Iraq, but it's not Afghanistan. Now, uh, does that also, I know you said for Vietnam, but th would that also carry for an individual on board of a naval vessel uh, that was in the area of Kuwait? Yes, if they were on the ground at any point in time, they had to have been on ground. Outstanding. On to the next question, brother. Once again, I'm, uh, I, I apologize for the... Uh, for the time consuming, but uh, it, it, you just you're a plethora of knowledge, and we're trying to ascertain as much information uh, out of that beautiful brain sack of yours. Uh, but <laughs> let, let, <laughs> let's let's keep it moving. Let's keep it moving forward. Now, I assume uh, the VA laws and the regulations, man, they they have to change, and I'm assuming they change every year. Very often, uh, they're coming out with 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 changes regarding the claims. Have you heard about any new changes that are coming up regarding the VA stating, "Oh, wow, um, this could be tied to uh, to this. Uh, this could be uh, a secondary condition to this." Is there any new information coming out? Because studies are are coming out from physicians and doctors, and is the VA uh, taking that information from these studies? Are they taking that, and, and are they looking to make changes? Um, right now, I don't see any uh, major changes coming. Like internally, we have changes every week, but it's just how we handle the claims process and how we handle claims when we receive them. But major things that um, are facing veterans out there when it comes to claims and evidence and things like that, I don't see anything major right now. Okay. What are the different types of evidences that a veteran can submit uh, to help their claim in support of their claim? You have what is called mm -hmm. buddy statement. Mm -hmm. statement. Um, those are very important. Like you may have a veteran who did you does say not have, you said you said buddy statements, right? Yes, buddy statement. That's um, also, that's also considered as a lame evidence. Is that correct? Right. 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 Um, you have. You have veterans who may not have the, the evidence in their record, like service treatment records might not have anything, um, or they may not have any STRs at all, service treatment records. So we would ask the vet to give us a buddy statement. Um, give us a statement showing that you had a buddy that witnessed these things, or they can say that you were a part of this scenario or this certain situation. So that's we would take that evidence, that buddy statement, and look at it, at it, we we'll look at that evidence as as the gospel because, I mean, it's a certified statement. It's something that will be a part of that veteran's file. So, obviously, so, a letter from the spouse would help immensely. Oh, very, very much so. Uh, very much so. What about a statement from the veteran himself? That will help as well because you have what is called a 21-4138 statement in support of the claim. So... I recommend to all veterans when they file a claim to always use that form and explain how that disability came about um, and how it's affecting you now. You want to paint a picture for the person who's going to work on your claim as easy as you can because there's so many claims that come across that there's no explanation and the person on the other end is left to try to figure it out. Mm. If you explain... If you explain and paint the picture for that person that's going to work and claim mm -hmm. another thing, mm -hmm. yes. it's going to help out for you. Yes, yes, I, I, I see. So your stating is just don't submit a claim. St submit a statement explaining why and the yes. actions pertaining to that particular day of how you occurred the injury. Yes. It makes Very absolute helpful. sense. Makes absolute sense. Now, aside from utilizing that VA form, uh, which is a certified document. Uh, could it also be? Uh, could could a veteran also utilize the route of creating or or having a, a buddy statement written uh, in the position of a business form letter, and then having that notarized by an official notary? You can do that, and you can just actually write a letter and sign it, and date it, and send it in. Does the notarized letter hold any weight, either or? There's no difference in it when it comes to those letters. 
So you would say to someone, just save your money? I would say save your money. <laughs> okay, I'm going to save my money. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now, Brother Avery, uh, please explain what a DBQ form is and a nexus letter from your Dr. R, and, and is one more effective than the other? Uh, for example, if, if I'm a veteran uh, and, and I have uh, plantar fasciitis, and, and I believe it's it's related to uh, to the military, do I present my private doctor with a DBQ form, uh, or do I ask him to please write a, a statement um, a nexus letter of connectivity, which would be more effective, which would, would could you please explain uh, what a DBQ letter is and a Lexus letter is and, and which is more effective uh, than the other, or if not? I would say that this is going to be the most important piece of this podcast. If you're listening, make sure you're paying attention to this part right here. Uh, disability questionnaire is very, very important. The nexus letter is very important. Like when a veteran claims any kind of disability, it's going to be on the VA to find evidence and to determine if we want to send that veteran for an exam who can be with a contractor or could be with the VA themselves because the contractors are contracted out by the VA. So the VA is slammed with contract exams, like they can send them out to the contractors. But um, the DBQ, disability questionnaire, I recommend that any veteran who is submitting a claim submit their own DBQs because I say this, you have a lot of veterans out there who go to the VA and they have a history with a certain doctor or they may go to a private doctor and have a history with that doctor. If you get your private doctor to write that DBQ up for you, they know your history. They know what you've dealt with. They know everything about you. They can write it all on that disability questionnaire and you can submit that with your claim and it would cause your claim to go straight for rate. A rater would look at it and be like, okay, let me rate this individual. If you don't submit that DBQ, it's going to be on us to gather the evidence. It's going to be on us to get you to an exam and you want to go in front of a, a doctor who you don't even know. You don't even know this person. Like They don't know you. They're looking at a record. They may not look at a record. We don't know. One thing we know is we get you to that exam, we did our job. We get you to that exam. Mm. So it's important to get that DBQ from your doctor, yourself, to submit it with your claim. Now, will a nexus letter from your private doctor negate the comp and pension examination from the VA doctor? No, it won't. It, it'll help. A nexus letter will like point us in the direction of, okay, let me look at this area of his records to see if this is matching what he's saying, or let me see if he has the evidence to match what the doctor is writing, because there's a lot of times where the doctors are writing letters like that, but they had not even looked at the military file. Mm. So it's not going to hurt. I mean, it's not going to help that bit at all. Mm. So if, if a nexus letter is being written by the doctor, because some doctors don't fill out the DBQs, and I don't know why, because they don't they don't want to take their time doing it, but if they use a nexus letter, the veteran submits a nexus letter, they have to make sure that their doctor has looked at their military records and can say that because of the military, they're having issues with these certain disabilities. They have to put that, that language into that, that letter. I believe, this is just my humble opinion, I believe a lot of the times why a physician wouldn't want to fill out such a document is because a lot of the times it is time consuming. Uh, number one, the doctor, in order for the statement to be effective, number one would have to look at, at the veteran's C file, his his record, his medical record, correct? Yeah, correct. And that could, you know, depending on the number of pages within that file, that record, it could take numerous amount of hours. And then he would have to make the connection of the disability and, and, and connect it uh, with military service. So that takes a great amount of time. And doctors 
they're busy individuals. They're 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 professionals yeah. to get individuals in and out of the office. Um, mm -hmm. Would you recommend or would you state it would be a good option to possibly communicate with the doctor? Uh, listen, I know this is going to take a lot of your time. This is a huge favor that you will be doing for me. And because of the time that you would be uh, consuming, looking through my files, I have no issues with incurring a bill for for your time. And uh, would, would there be any issues with that as far as, as, as stating, hey, look, you're a busy individual. Your profession is to get patients in and out. And I'm asking you to take a look at my documents, which, ladies and gentlemen, they have nothing on. There is nothing on paper stating that they have to do that for you. So right. uh, would there be any issues with the patient, you being the veteran, stating, hey, look, you know, I will compensate you for the time lost of, of, of bringing in patients if you can take time to look through through my files. Do you think that's an acceptable summary? That is, is very, I mean, it's very acceptable. I mean, if you go in there and you tell your doctor what you're trying to do, you explain to them what you're trying to do and why it needs to happen. I think a lot of doctors will work with you. And what will help, too, is don't go in there and give them 1,500 pages of medical records. Right. If you're trying to clean something, find that information, print that information out, or a tablet or something where the doctor can easily find it and be able to write stuff up for you. Want to, you want to minimize the impact on that doctor Perfect. just by you yourself and doing this whole thing. Perfect. So in summary for that question, what you're saying is have your physician, your doctor fill out a DBQ statement uh, and within that statement, have him submit what would technically be a nexus letter within the remarks statements, correct? Correct. You can do all that. And the VA itself has a web, a web page where they have all the disability questionnaires for each disease or disability online. Perfect. On to the next question, my brother. Thank you for it, man. That was a great one. Uh, great, great info. Now, would you advise a veteran to fight a denied claim or wait for some time and then reopen the claim and return with more substantial evidence if they can? Uh, and if they want to reopen the claim, how long do they have to wait in order to reopen that denied claim? Okay, so let's say, for example, you yourself, you get a notification letter saying, hey, you've been denied for asthma, you've been denied for plantar fasciitis, or you've been denied for everything that you claimed, right? You got denied for that letter, you got denied for those disabilities yesterday with the date of that letter. You received that letter yesterday, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Well, April 21st, you received the letter saying, hey, you've been denied for so and so. You have a year from that date to come back towards the VA with new and material evidence showing that they need to reevaluate that denial. So yesterday you got denied. You can wake up this morning. You can wake up this week. You can wake up a month from now and say, you know what? I'm going to resubmit some new evidence and I want to fight this thing. So it's, it's okay for a veteran to fight because that's why you have these different steps in place. You have a year from that notification date to fight and um, get new evidence in there. Like, it's, it's, it's easier for them to do it within a year. So perhaps you, perhaps, a year, you, perhaps you can get your physician to submit a DBQ statement document. Correct. Correct. Um, the biggest thing, too, is if you get notified by the VA that you've been denied, you need to read that letter that they send you because they're going to let you know why they denied you mm. and what they're looking for in order to connect you. Mm. It's all in that paperwork, and a lot of veterans don't read it. It's right there. They give you the answers to the test. All you have to do is read it. All you got to do is read it. Read it. A lot of them, they see, they see denial, 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 and then they toss it to the side. And they just forget about it. You got to read the black and white that they send you because they give you all the information that you need in order to be connected. Now, what what would be the most fruitful way of going about it? Uh, the denied claim is uh, is is fighting it, or to wait and then once again reopen the claim. 
Okay, so within one year of the notification, if you come back in, you can request what is called for a reconsideration. A lot of veterans don't know about that. You can be reconsidered based on new and material evidence that you submit. So, and what, what is? Um, I apologize. What is the the time length for that? You want to do that within one year of that notification letter, and if you wait until more than a year, is is what you call a reopening claim. So, anything under a year is reconsideration. Anything over a year is a reopen. So you have reconsideration. A lot of veterans don't know about reconsideration. So if they get denied for something, you can come back in on a new claim and say, hey, you know, I was denied on so-and-so date. I request to be reconsidered for so-and-so. But make sure you turn in new and material evidence that has not been looked at. And the evidence that's been looked at is on the letter that they send you in the denial. You can't send the same information in and ask for reconsideration. There's got to be new evidence that has not been looked at before. I see. And then for the reconsideration, it has to be submitted within 12 months uh, within the denial period, correct? Correct. Okay. Now, for the reopen of the claim, how long was must a veteran wait to reopen a claim after denial? You can, you can, you can reconsider. You can re reopen. Any time after the fact, um, the way they look at it on the VA side is you have one year from the date as a reconsideration. Anything over a year is a reopen. Is a reopen. Um, right. So now, we, I'm assuming when you reopen a claim, you would also have to submit supporting brand new supporting evidence to reopen your claim. Is that correct? That's correct. My man, let's move on to the next question, man. This is awesome. <laughs> Goodness, man, your wealth of knowledge. I appreciate you so much, brother. No um, problem, man. A, a great tool that I've utilized to help me uh, in networking uh, with veterans, man. That networking is is a key word. Net, I, I network with you. You know, you and I, we served in Iraq, uh, combat mm -hmm. veterans. Uh, to me, you're a plethora and a wealth of knowledge. I, I looked for you for guidance and information. That to me is key networking. Uh, do you have mm -hmm. any other outstanding, great tools that you would suggest for veterans to help them uh, with their cause aside from networking? I would say to hook up with a veterans organization um, because there are so many veterans out there, man, in your town that you live in. There's veterans that you work next to, like. Don't be afraid to shake hands and, and tell your story and introduce yourself because you never know who you're going to come across, mm. whether it's someone you work next to or somebody that may be in one of those veterans organizations. Mm. Um, another way is to get on what is called LinkedIn. LinkedIn, there is so many veterans out there, man, that's, that's for the cause and trying to help each other. Mm. So mm. many of them. I'm going to look into that. You know... The reason why I say networking is such a great, powerful tool, man, is because if you keep your trap shut, nobody's going to know your issues. Nobody's going to know exactly. what, what you're going through with the moment you open your suck and, and you connect with another veteran and, and you start talking about uh, ailments and, hey, were you, were you getting disability for that? Mm -hmm. Did you know that could be considered a, a situation that you got from a particular location that, that you served in? No, no, I, right. I, w I was unaware. Well, uh, well, why don't you come over here under the learning tree and let me teach you something, by all means. <laughs> uh, I, let me, let me, hold on, uh, let me go to the store, let me get some 40s. Let's kick it, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, you know, that's why I consider networking to be such a vital tool, man, because out of a basic conversation of, hey, man, you know, what's cracking, man? Hey, man, boom, 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 boom. He was in the service. I mean, it was in service. Yeah, man, me, Marine Corps. Oh, yeah, boom. All of a sudden, you, you, you ascertain a wealth of knowledge. And uh, that individual all of, a sudden be, all, all of a sudden can change your life with a with a piece of knowledge. Uh, yeah. So that's very yeah. imperative for the veterans who, who, who are listening is, is A, hey, man, I know some of you individuals are dealing with some some situations, but but you got to be able to to open up just a tad bit and and just let some people know uh, you know what you're dealing with, man, because that person can have something uh, a wealth of information for you. Now, what are the most common 
claims when you were working a, a, as a volunteer that, that you saw coming through your station and what are the successful veterans doing that others are not as far as their claim? Uh, well, I've seen so many different types of claims. Like you see dependency claims, you'll see Agent Orange claims, you'll see go for claims. Like you'll see claims for stuff that veterans know they didn't get in the military. Like it's so many things you see on a daily basis. Um, the one thing that stands out when I look at those types of claims is there are some veterans out there that are well prepared. You can tell that they read online. You can tell that they know what they're talking about or they have somebody in their corner that can put them in the right direction. Mm. Like their claim is prepared, man. Like they, they submit it. Like they got a statement and support a claim. They, they, they paint the picture. They provide the evidence. Like they don't have. The VA goes looking for the evidence. Like, they mm. provide everything with the claim on the same day the claim comes in. Like, mm. they are prepared. Like, hey, you and, can make a decision on this claim right now based off of everything I'm giving you. And, and, and is that considered a a, a fully uh, formed claim? What's the name of that? Fully developed claim. You're fully, correct. Fully developed claim. Mm-hmm. A fully, a fully developed claim, everybody's going to come in under a fully developed claim unless there is something that is missing that the VA has to go and look for. Like uh, you may have a vet that comes in saying that I want to claim PTSD. Okay, but they don't submit anything else. No, di like, no, no diagnosis. No diagnosis or they don't submit a 0781 form, which is a stressor form, telling the VA, hey, this is the reason why I got PTSD. So... If that form is missing or you got diagnosis and stuff that are missing, you're going to get booted out of the fully developed claim process and go to the standard claim process. I see. Because you're missing information. Because now the VA has to send you to an appointment with a physician or a psychiatrist to get diagnosed for PTSD, correct? No, no. The, the VA wouldn't send you for that, that information. We would reach out to the veteran themselves and hey, say, provide us the reason why you got PTSD. And then we'll make a decision on if we're going to send you for an exam or not. I see. Now, now there's different forms and different levels of PTSD. Is that correct? Correct. Now, the the depending on the level of PTSD that the individual has, then the individual will receive different levels of compensation. Is that correct? Yes, I mean, there's different levels according to the DSM-5. Um, I think it's a, a manual where they look at mental um, disorders. Um, it, it's, like a, it's like scale levels within that manual. Hey, if you hit this level right here, you get rated at this position. Or you hit this level right here, mm. you get rated at this position. Mm. I've seen veterans who are rated at 100% PTSD. Like, wow. they are really out there. Like, they got some issues going on with them. Wow. Or I've seen veterans who got thirty percent. It just depends on the level of how PTSD is causing them the issues that they have. Now, initially, of in order to receive PTSD benefits, the VA has to initially a VA physician or doctor has to diagnose them. Is that correct? Um, it could be where the the, the the doctor has diagnosed them on the VA side, or it can be a private doctor. Okay. Um, but the way the VA looks at it, as if, if the if the veteran comes in and saying they're going to put in for PTSD, the VA is going to look for a couple of things. One, they're going to look at the DD two fourteen to see where that veteran That's had been, been to. something the program. Mm -hmm. Or we're going to look for a combat action ribbon, or we're going to look for a uh, uh, the CAB on the Army side. Uh, the, the combat action badge. Right. Like, that right there is telling us, hey, this dude has been, or this lady has been in, in the, the shit. You know, in, we got to get this thing exam. In the thick of the mud. Right. Right. So, you may have a veteran who had never deployed, don't have those badges or those medals, but they're claiming PTSD. So, like, you got people out there who's been assaulted. Like, you got um, families who may have a husband or a wife claim PTSD because they were in domestic violence or right. they witnessed a, a car crash on the side of the road where they were helping people get out of a burning vehicle or something. Like, there's Perfect. different types of PTSD that is not just tied to combat. 
perfect, perfect. So, but that, but that would designate them as a different category because one thing that 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 I noticed with the VA was that when I first went into their services for care uh, for medication was uh, they asked they asked me for my DD two fourteen, and on my my folder they wrote combat veteran. And then yeah. there was a folder to the left of that that said veteran. And then there was a folder to the right inside these nicely stacked bins that said POW or combat wounded. Um, yeah. So they the VA designates and has veterans selected in three different mm-hmm. tiers, which is veteran, combat veteran, POW, and or combat wounded, correct? Correct. Right. My man, okay, let we we pushing through it, brother. I know, I know, we pushing through it. Okay, <laughs> are, are there any benefits for veterans that are not well known, uh, that are left unclaimed, that a lot of veterans just don't know about? I'm gonna tell. Um, there's there's so many benefits out there, man. Like depending on where you're located at, what state you're in, um, you need to look at the the veterans section of state benefits because there's a lot of benefits out there that are left on the table that veterans don't know of. Um, I know here in Georgia, uh, one, one thing that is a big deal is like veterans can go to their local county and get free license plates. Um, you have veterans that if they get a hundred percent, they'll get property taxes eliminated. Um, it's just so many things that are out there that veterans don't know of. But you have to research. You have to talk to people. Right. You have to talk to other veterans that are right. around you, or veterans that you may meet on a daily basis, because there's a lot of things that are left on the table. Brother Avery, why why is is the benefits or the benefits so secretive? Like why 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 is the network so imperative, and why isn't it just out there for for like a network service like Facebook? Uh, for individuals to ascertain uh, this information is because uh, it just seems like a very secretive, uh, underground, informative network. Why is that? Let me, let me tell you this. You already know. What does the world run on? Money. It's all about the money, brother. That's right. It's That's all about right. the money, but I'm going to tell you that there is tons of money in the VA um, the VA is the second biggest federal agency. Mm. There's there's tons of money, man. Like the VA has the tools and the benefits to help veterans. But the thing that's important is the veterans have to come correct. They have to provide the information that is needed mm. to get them the benefits, man. Like if you're not providing the information, you can't say, oh, the VA is doing this, the VA is doing that. Mm. You have to provide the information because the VA is going to tell you what they're looking for specifically. Mm. And if you hit those targets, you're going to get the benefit. You have, to, as a veteran, you have to do the research. You have to do the research and you have to provide everything that the VA is looking for in order to get you the benefits, man, because there's plenty of veterans out here that's been getting veterans the, the benefits for years. Mm. And there's plenty of veterans out here that don't even know about the process, but right. you have to do the research, you have to talk to people, and you got to provide everything that's required on the VA side to, to get rated and get benefit. Listen, man, brother Avery, thank you for the wealth of knowledge that you just given many, many veterans, uh, that, that are hopefully, I hope that, that are listening to the podcast, man, this has been something great. I appreciate the time. I appreciate the laughs. I appreciate the times that we spent in Iraq. Listen, man, I'm going to tell you something, man. Without you there, you know, without Chalky there, without Guy Eagles there, without some of the great folks we had there in Iraq adjacent to us, man, great Marines left and right, it would have been such a horrid, horrid tour. But I will tell you this. I especially hold you uh, close to my heart and man shit dude uh we, we, we your rack was adjacent to mine and you will be like hey look man listen to this cd hey you listen to this cd and and i hold you you have no idea man i hold you in such high regard and such high respect you know the fact that we're able to sit down and 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 digest the same type of music and bop our heads to the same lyrical devastation that these artists put out that's what connects me to you and and the fact that you and I we served together in a combat 
country and were able to come back and you were able to be a part of my wedding, a wedding party, and you you held up the, the non-commissioned officer's sword at my wedding was, 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 listen, man, thank you so much for that, by the way, man. I, I, I don't know how to thank you. I really don't, man. Man, but, uh, just, I just, before I reply to that, um, all the veterans listening out there, this is the gold mine of benefit information you need to check out. Benefits.va.gov. Once again, benefits.va.gov. If you got a phone, if you have internet at the house, if you have work internet, if you have a library next door, I don't care where you go look at it. Go to that website right there, and there is so many benefits on there that you'll uncover just by clicking through the links. My man. But, uh, but man, Carlos, man, architect, uh, man, it's, it's been a pleasure, man. Uh, from the date I seen you at Pendleton in 2000. 2004 up until now, man, it's just, it's been a journey, man. And, uh, I don't know, man, you got people that come into your life and cross your path, like life and relationships with people are like seasons, man. Seasons don't come and go just like they come on, come with us every, every year. But, um, when you get that season that comes into your path, man, that, uh, is, is uh positive and it's an asset. You want to keep that season around, man. So, I mean, that's definitely something that you provided over the time, and I know we're going to be laughing and giggling with about, about stupid Iraq stories, man, well into our, our older years, man, gray hairs in the face. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. You know, real quick, man, when 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 the podcast was created, man, it was to show my, my interest in music and particular artists, and then uh, it moved on to expand on uh, life experiences and, and most importantly, people that I felt were imperative in my life. And uh, I decided to start putting those individuals uh, within the podcast that made an impact in my life uh, to share uh, a, a sequential part, uh, pretty much my story. And uh, everyone who, who I have on the podcast has made a great, great impact on my life. And you are one of those individuals. And I'm so blessed and I, I'm so happy that you were able to to you know we were able to put your voice on, on record and, and have you up uh, up on here and then just spread out the knowledge that that you just gave out uh you know that would help so many veterans out you know who just don't even know that these benefits ex exist man so believe me man it has been much more pleasure of mine than it was for yours i i truly apologize i know i i told you hey look i'll probably have you on here for 45 minutes maybe an hour here we are running an hour and 51 minutes damn near two hours but every minute of it every minute of it has been great i i know uh you and i will speak uh further on later on in the future um uh, and um man just thank you so much for, and i truly truly appreciate it you know after i sign off just don't hang up let me let me talk to you real quick after i sign off man but aside from that uh is there anything you want to you want to give out to the listeners hey get your education use the gi bill if you had um i know with me i was i was fortunate while i was in to uh use tuition assistance and get my bachelor's degree while i was in and then when i got out I use my GI Bill to get my master's. So, I mean, education is another way to get knowledge. And putting the right people in your corner is another way to get knowledge. Use your assets. Use everything that's out there in front of you. As veterans, we are blessed with so many things. You got to get off your ass and you got to use them because this world is cold. This world is going to kick you to the side. But if you do things the right way, you will be very successful out here. And I just I, I leave people with that, man, because there's a lot of people that just they don't they don't take advantage of everything that's in front of them. And with you, my man, like it's been a pleasure, man. And uh, any time, man, I got your back on anything, man. So uh, just let me know, man. Thank you, my brother. Just go ahead. Stay on the phone real quick, man. Let me go ahead and sign off. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been your host, DJ Architect. It has been a great, great pleasure to have my homeboy, man, my combat veteran compadre. 
Gunnery Sergeant Avery on the mic with us, uh, giving us great information. This has been Chapter 39 for your monkey ass. This is your homeboy, the architect, representing the place to be. I love you guys. Thank you guys for listening. Uh, once again, Chapter the Architect, DG Architect out. DJ Architect. Architect.